Great. Uh, hello and welcome to our Intro to Winter Adventures workshop, um, coming to you live from the Portland State University Outdoor Program. Our goal today is to get you a wealth of information on uh, snow and winter-based adventures such as skiing, snowshoeing, things like this, and the hazards that are related to them. Uh, your presenters today will be myself, Ian Clark. Uh, I am an assistant trip leader at the Outdoor Program. And I'll... Yeah, and um, my name is Carl Snyder, and I'm coming live from my bedroom um, because of COVID. <laughs> um, yeah, and I am also a trip leader at the out Outdoor Program as well. Excellent. Thanks a lot. Uh, if you can bring us to the next slide, that would be awesome. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so before we get into the meat of it, really want to talk about uh, Leave No Trace. This is essentially a set of principles that can be applied to outdoor adventure in order to leave the space uh, pristine enough that others can enjoy it in the same way you did. I'll move through them really quickly. Normally I like to spend more time on them, but we'll highlight one today. So first of all, plan ahead and prepare. Make sure that you know your route in advance so you're not getting yourself into a situation where you have to make sketchy decisions, uh, endangering your life or the environment around you. Travel and camp on durable surfaces. Uh, you should know that snow is a durable surface, so camping on snow is great. Try not to hurt vegetation around you, especially when you set up camp. Dispose of waste properly. This is the one that we're highlighting today. Uh, that's because when you're doing winter adventures, unfortunately, it is really important that you pack out all of your waste. That means food waste as well as poop. Um, that's just unfortunate, but that's just the way it is because unfortunately, otherwise, it just it won't disintegrate until you know the next summer or spring. It could end up directly in a water source that folks need. Um, so unfortunately, we just have to pack out all of our waste and that's just kind of how it is. So I really, please take that into consideration when you plan your trips. Um, four, leave what you find. Don't take stuff, <laughs> rocks and the like. Minimize campfire impacts. So unlikely that you'll be having a campfire in the snow, um, but minimizing the impacts of that in any way you can. Respect wildlife, of course, and be considerate of other visitors who may be out there. So a lot of these come down to that. Yeah, we can move on now. All right, there are a lot of resources about the information we're sharing today. Uh, the Freedom of the Hills that you see on the right is essentially the Bible of mountaineering. Uh, and a lot of these contain valuable information. You can find resources yourself online as well. All right. And there are a lot of organizations that can help. As you can see, the biggest one here is the outdoor program, the Portland State Outdoor Program. Uh, feel free to give us a call or come in person. We have a lot of expertise uh, in the shop. There's also REI has a great website with tons of info that honestly we took some from uh, for this presentation. So there's a lot of good stuff on there. Mountain Meadows has a lot of expertise for, regarding these things, as well as keeping uh, counts of you know snow height stuff like that on Mount Hood. And Next Adventure has expertise as well. All right, so here's a quick overview of what we're going to be chatting about today. Uh, the first main category is going to be safety. Uh, so talking about winter driving, cold and wet weather, layering, navigation, a number of hazards, and then we're going to move into snow skills, uh, including tent and camp setup, ice axe, and self arrest. Uh, skiing, snowshoeing, and using some other tools associated with the trade. Next slide, please. Great. Uh, so getting right into it uh, with winter driving. Uh, this slide is essentially a couple of things to take into account when considering winter, winter driving. I just want to say right off the bat that um, winter driving can go fairly wrong fairly quickly. Uh, you do have to be careful that you're you know, prepared for a bad situation when you're entering into a winter driving thing. Hopefully nothing bad happens, um, but this can be one of the and generally is one of the more dangerous things of participating in uh, these, act these outdoor activities. So really consider these tips that I'm about to share from this uh, infographic right in front of you. First of all, maintaining your car, uh, checking tires, battery. Essentially, if your car is breaking down and causing you troubles in the city, that's not the car that you're gonna wanna take into a you know, far rural area, especially with snowy conditions. Two, having especially an ice scraper, windshield fluid, uh, blankets to keep you warm and a shovel. Biggest one is a shovel. I've seen people get into really bad situations without a shovel in your car when you get into these situations. So that's super important, those four things. Uh, know before you go, checking weather conditions, believe them when you see them. If it tells you it's gonna be the biggest blizzard in Oregon or wherever, believe it uh, and expect delays. That will happen. All right, next slide, please. All right, so this infographic is helping out by providing a list of things to bring in your car. I would highly recommend, uh, especially having water, snacks, an ice scraper, not mentioned here, a shovel, really important again, warm clothes, warm blankets to keep you warm, a phone charger for communication, a flashlight will help you out a lot when it gets dark out. Most importantly on this list, having tire chains. Uh, you don't wanna get into a situation where you don't have tire chains and you're stuck somewhere. Uh, that's probably the most important thing on this list, but also jumper cables because batteries die really fast in the cold, flares, no one really has flares. Um, and a full tank of gas is super important when you get into a rural area. 
I guess if you have Thursday with my car, I don't know. Uh, and I wanted to chat really quickly here about uh, my experience. So just super briefly, uh, I, my partner and I went on a great winter backpacking, snowshoeing adventure. Uh, adventure. This was about two years ago out in the Waldo Lake Wilderness area. We stayed at a cabin, it was great, and came back to our car. Uh, not a, it was great weather when we were out there, just some snow on the second day. Um, when we got back to our car, it was covering about two feet of snow. We were at the epicenter of what turned out to be just a huge blizzard, the biggest one in Oregon at that time, uh, just the very epicenter of it. And when we got to the highway, uh, it's a small one lane on each side highway, I think it's Highway 54 maybe. Um, we had about a one hour trip we were expecting to get back to Eugene and then about two more hours to Oregon. Uh, that one hour stretch ended up taking us about six to seven hours uh, well into the morning uh, because of so many fallen trees, so much ice. I counted over 20 cars flipped in that on that trip. Um, so this stuff is really serious. And so being prepared with these things, I can't imagine how much worse that night would have been if we didn't have tire chains and shovel um, and all these different things. So yeah, really important stuff. I, I really recommend taking this driving stuff seriously, but I'm that will bring it to a wrap for now. I'll take the next slide. All right, uh, the next thing talking about is layers. Uh, so a good layering system is incredibly important for winter adventures. Um, it will keep you warm, dry, and safe, even in unexpected conditions. Being unprepared essentially can lead to you being cold and wet, which can lead to you being near hypothermia, which can lead to symptoms such as confusion, jittering, uh, and can lead you to make some really poor decisions, fortunately. Even really um, wise people can make poor decisions when they're experiencing hypothermic, so hypothermic conditions. Um, so what we use for our layering system here, an acronym we like at the outdoor program is WISE. Uh, this stands for wicking, insulating, shell, and extras. So that'll become apparent what that means in future slides. But the wicking layer is the base layer next to your skin, wicking away moisture, synthetic or wool. Insulating, keeping that warmth in. Shell, keeping the moisture out. Uh, waterproof layer and extras, including hats, sunglasses, stuff like that. So next slide, please. All right, for the upper body, you're gonna want your base layer to be a synthetic fabric or merino wool. There are great under layers like the one on the farthest left that you see on the bottom there. Uh, if you just have a t-shirt, what I use is an athletic t-shirt that's synthetic sometimes. Um, that is acceptable, better, way better than cotton. Insulating layers, think fleece or puffy jacket. Um, these will keep the heat on the inside. Uh, and the outer layer should be, a, you should have a waterproof with you. You don't have to wear it all the time, uh, but it should be insulated or not, it doesn't have to be insulated. It can be insulated or non-insulated, but it does just have to be, you need to have a waterproof layer with you. All right, uh, and for the lower body, you're gonna wanna wear um, something for your, your leg on the, on the base layer that's once again, a wicking layer, uh, synthetic or wool. Uh, there's you know, something along the lines of athletic leggings or long underwear or base layer pants, something like that. Uh, anything you have that's, in, that's um, synthetic or wool that will go right on your skin, not cotton. Insulating layer, something like synthetic or fleece pants. Some people do have puffy pants. That's crazy, it's super awesome. Uh, the outer layer should be rain pants or something like insulated winter pants. Uh, and the middle layer here is generally pretty optional because your legs, you won't lose as much heat as your core. All right, next slide, please. All right, this is something that can cause you a lot of misery if you get it wrong. I highly recommend not getting this wrong and even spending some money if you have to here. Um, so you're gonna want at least two to three pairs of non-cotton socks. Those are synthetic and merino wool. They should be thick and warm. That seriously will save you. Um, some boots that are ideally higher ankle and waterproof. Um, if it's just a really light adventure, then maybe you don't need a fully waterproof boot, but I would recommend something higher ankle. Um, yeah, something like that. And then gaiters are an extra that's really important here when you're in the snow. Uh, so these are something that basically clips on under your boot and goes up your uh, calf to a certain extent. I would recommend getting some that go up to your calf about midway or closer to your knee. These will keep snow out of your, out of your, uh, off your socks out of your boots, keep you a lot warmer by having some of these. So if you don't have some of these and you're planning on doing a winter adventure, it is my personal advice that you really get some. You can grab them at the outdoor program if you happen to be in Portland uh, or at your local outdoor supplier. All right, next slide, please. Great, so some extras that are super important. Having a hat and a face buff or a balaclava to do both. Uh, these should be thick and warm. Uh, both of these are important. Sunglasses will prevent snow blindness. Uh, so with the snow reflecting tons of sunlight, uh, in the right conditions, the wrong conditions, you can get something called snow blindness where essentially your eyes are burned. They're basically sunburned uh, and you can no longer see effectively. It hurts to have your eyes open. That's a very dangerous condition to be in. So sunglasses can help with that. Goggles are optional, but recommended for extreme conditions. All right. Uh, next. Something I want to just quick say, um, another 
couple of extras, and I think these aren't really thought of as layering, but I think of them as that, is um, sunscreen and chapstick, especially if you're gonna be out in the winter um, environment. I know that's especially the sunscreen sounds counterintuitive, but if you're out and it's sunny out and the snow reflects a lot, and so you actually get more um, light and radiation on your skin that way, and so you definitely wanna have that with you. Yeah, that's a really good point. Uh, thanks for bringing that up. Uh, just to add on to that, if you want to uh, look up the 10 essentials online, that's a really important list that will contain those things. Uh, and that's something you should be bringing with you on every trip as well. Specifically, those are good points on uh, winter adventure trips, but try to make sure you're bringing the 10, the 10 essentials on every trip. We don't mention that in the presentation. All right, uh, pre precipitation, uh, moving along from that. Precipitation is something that can come from within and from without. A uh, fun fact that I learned via Google is that the human body can produce about 14 liters of precipitation via sweat uh, per day, or four liters per hour at a maximum, uh, which is an insane amount of liquid. Uh, and so it very much is, uh, you have to watch out for that sweat happening. Um, ways to do that, I've got a list here. Breathability when outside precipitation is low. We were already on the list, that's right. Um, <laughs> so you don't have to wear those like waterproof layers if there's not a lot of precipitation coming from the outside. You wanna start slightly cold. So you wanna be a little bit cold as you're starting to move. And you want to stop and delay or if you get too warm immediately, even if you're with a group, seriously, stop. You don't want to let that sweat start to build up. Uh, that will lead to you kind of alternating between too hot, too cold uh, in a bad situation where that could be hypothermic. Sweat is the enemy, yes. All right, and fighting it from the outside a little bit more straightforward, having a high quality waterproof layer um, and having good insulating layers. The idea with the insulating layers is that they can keep your heat inside, keep that outside layer cold, and then when snow hits it, it won't melt. Yeah. Great, uh, really quickly, dangerous temperatures, obviously the slide is super lazy, uh, but essentially what I wanna convey here is that uh, the colder the temperature is not necessarily the more dangerous. Sometimes the sneakiest, uh, deadliest temperatures are between you know, 30 to 40 degrees Fahrenheit, maybe zero to like five Celsius. Um, that's because there's, when it's significantly below freezing, say 28, 25 or below, uh, there's not a lot of precipitation. Any precipitation in the air is gonna be snow. It's not gonna directly get you wet. The snow on the ground, it's not gonna melt immediately when it hits you or when it touches you. Uh, whereas if you're above that 32 or really near it, you can get, you know, you can get uh, rain that falls and freezes on things. You can get totally soaked and you can still be in a really cold environment. So that's why there's a little red marker right here around this temperature range. You really have to watch out when it starts to get above 30 something like that uh, and below 40, you know, there's a really dangerous range in there. And that's, that's the point of the slide. That's what I'm trying to get across and that's it. Great, uh, so as far as sleeping goes in cold and wet weather uh, and a couple techniques. Uh, so as far as gear, a sleeping bag rated for below your expected temperature can be important to bring out in these situations in case you get into a compromising situation where you've allowed it to get moist or something like that. Uh, bring insulating layers into your bag with you, your puffy, um, your fleece wear socks that can keep you significantly warmer and have an appropriate tent. If you're above tree line, having a four season tent is important. If you're below tree line, you can get away with a three season tent, um, but trying to use as much ventilation as you can in these situations is good. Uh, pro tips, heat when you need to, your body doesn't have to heat as much stuff. Um, bring a hot water bottle into bed with you if you have the chance, that is definitely not gonna leak like an algae, something like that. Uh, and get warm before getting into the bag. Do some push-ups, crunches, even in the bag if you have to, that's fine. Um, all of these are really good pieces of advice. And next slide, please. Great, and the last thing that I'm gonna touch on before I hand it over to Carl is navigation. Um, so navigation, there are a couple of hazards that are uniquely associated uh, with these winter adventures, and I'll get to those on the next slide, but for now, some of the things that you need to know is that you need to be extra careful with navigation because of these hazards. Uh, and a couple of pro tips, you need to have a group with you uh, and you need to keep your group in visible range. You need to have some tools that help you navigate in low visibility conditions. A GPS or such as a phone or a standalone GPS device, you can see a picture of one of those on the bottom right. Uh, you need to inform a trusted person of your forms in detail, your plans rather, um, in detail so that they can send the rescue team if that's something that's necessary. You need to have a specific plan and you need to know when to be able to turn back because this is more, more dangerous than uh, non-winter adventures. So uh, specifically, you need to have a map, a compass, and a GPS device. And you need to have thorough knowledge of your plan and the applicable hazards. That goes for people in your group as well. You can have you know, an expert, but everyone needs to have a baseline understanding of that. 
Uh, next, we'll get into the hazards that I was chatting about. Um, so some of these that I described from this resource here, you can carefully type that link into your browser if you want to browse it yourself. Um, trail signs can be hidden by snow. Uh, all kinds of markings, even on trees, can be buried in snow, especially when this, that snow gets up to 10 feet or something like that. You can get into low visibility situations where you can't see even what used to be you know, a clear trail or something like that. Low contrast, everything looks white. That can be confusing. Deep snow uses a lot more energy. So a mile um, you know, snowshoeing is different from a mile walking. You'll have less daylight hours. That's pretty much guaranteed. It could depend on where you live. But um, in river and stream crossings are, can be very dangerous as you may not even notice that there's a stream there. Um, so that's something to watch out for. That's just a hazard that you have to be paying attention to. You should plan ahead for that. You should be seeing where these streams and rivers are so that you're not surprised by them. And you need to be keeping your eyes open for avalanche conditions. And that comes into the planning as well. All right, and I'll let Carl roll on. Great, so now I'm gonna to talk to y'all about um, several different topics kind of ranging from things that are dangerous to things that are annoying. And so post holing is kind of generally more annoying, but it can be dangerous as well. You can easily, um, you know, roll an ankle or break a foot or something like this, or, you know, maybe even a forearm or wrist when you fall. Um, and so it's definitely, important sometimes it can be annoying but you know you got to also be careful when you're out there and so post holding is basically when the surface of the snow um, no longer can hold your weight and then underneath that layer is kind of a light fluffier layer of snow and then you sink down you know sometimes just four or five inches six inches but then also sometimes you can go up to your waist as this person has done in the bottom um, right picture oh um and then so to avoid this, here are some tips or um, different tips in general of like how to deal with this. One is you can wear snowshoes or cross country skis, which again, you can rent from us at the outdoor program or gators. Um, and the, snows and the, uh, the snowshoes and the skis allow you to kind of stay on top of the surface of the snow um, and you won't break through that layer. Gators will help in case you are starting to break through um, just keeping snow out of your shoes. Um, and then some other things are you can just laugh it off. Maybe it's a one-off thing and there's just, most of the snow is has a nice layer and you're not actually going to fall through or you can try to endure. Um, but if it's happening regularly, you should probably just turn around and come back with the proper equipment. Um, and so the next obstacle that might occur or thing that you might see out there that is dangerous, is pretty dangerous, um, one of the most dangerous things kind of on you know, when you're out traveling in the winter, besides probably driving, um, is tree wells. And so these occur when you have trees that still have needles or leaves, always needles, I guess. Um, and, and the snow will accumulate on these needles and the branches, um, and they'll, they'll form this basically this cave almost underneath all of the branches. Um, and you can be sucked in into these holes, into these tree wells, because right around the rim of them, it starts to concave down. It will suck you in kind of like, if you imagine like a black hole or something like that. Um, and so you need to make sure you keep a good distance from trees and the base of the trees, um, because sometimes it can, they can surprise you. Um, so things to do, kind of tips generally, is you want to avoid this. And so you can avoid this by, you know, keeping that safe distance. Um, you can go slow. Um, so especially if you're not, you know, the most skilled, uh, be cautious. Um, but generally, you shouldn't be going into the backcountry where these things are more likely to be occurring until you have that experience and that skill and you're able to stop quickly and change direction quickly. Um, and then also, finally, if you are starting to go down a way to avoid or starting to get sucked in um, and you can't avoid going that direction, um, try to grab onto either the branches or the trunk of the tree. Um, and so here are some tips. I'm going to try to go over these very quickly. Um, probably won't go into them super detailed uh, for getting out. Um, and so there's kind of these general tips. And then there's tips for if help is coming. And then if you are alone and not expecting help, because you have different uh, plans depending on whether you're alone or not. Um, so in general, one of the great tips to have is always travel with somebody um, and make sure that when you're traveling, you stay in line of sight of each other. So then you know uh, if something maybe has happened, they can come back and look for you. Also wear avalanche beacons, probe and shovel 
have that with you and have the person that's with you also have those things. And so then that way they will be able to get you out and find you. Um, so another tip for trying to get out as you're falling in, try not to go head first. Cause if you go head first, it's gonna be much more difficult to get out um, and climb out. You'll have to first write yourself. And as you're trying to do these things and move around, um, you can move a little bit and have more snow fall in. Um, and also if you're going head first, you're more likely to have less of a, um, a gap of air around your face. Um, and that is essential to make sure um, that you have as much air as possible. Because when you people fall into these tree wells, the way that they end up dying is because they're running out of oxygen, because there's so much snow around them, they can't actually breathe. Um, and so that's super important. Um, so again, to improve the chances of that, um, as you're falling in, you're going to want to try to create an air pocket. And you do that by putting a hand either over or around your face. Um, and hopefully that can create a small pocket of air. Um, a thing to do once you're in there, it's very difficult to do is stay calm because if you start to freak out, um, you can again have more snow collapse on you. Um, and you also will be, be breathing more carbon dioxide, start hyperventilating, and it's just not a good place to be. Um, here's a few other general tips. Um, and then I'm going to move on to if help is coming, um, you should have a whistle with you. Hopefully, if you're going to the back country, you should have a plan for something like this. Uh, and you can blow the whistle and hopefully they'll find you. Otherwise, they'll also be using their beacon and they should find you with their beacon if you both have that. Um, if you are alone, it's a very different and much more scary situation. You're going to want to be very deliberate with your movements and try to um, slowly increase that pocket of air. Take off your skis or boots if you can um, and then try to write yourself up um, and hopefully you can call out and you can then use again those branches in the trunk if that's available to you. Um, there's a lot of other great resources out there um, for if you get into a situation like this and if you're going to be going to the backcountry um, with another person, you should definitely look into this more and have a good sense of what your plan is going to be. Um, okay, so snow bridges. Um, so snow bridges can form um, over rivers or uh, crevasses um, and they are dangerous because um, snow melts and snow changes and constantly and um, it can definitely break under your weight. Um, and so um, if you can, you should avoid them completely, you know, walk further downstream or find another way around. But if you can't, um, make sure you test the stability of that surface, go one at a time and probably go um, the lightest person first and kind of work your way over. Um, and then cornices. So cornices is another kind of thing to consider while you're out there. If you're going up a mountain, um, and especially if it's very steep and you have ridges, this is where cornices form. And you can kind of see in this diagram, the wind will blow and they'll kind of freeze and they'll start to form these basically snow and ice um, faces, um, cliffs, sides. And you can see in this picture on the right, that the, if somebody was up in this top right corner and they fell, it would be a very bad day for them. Um, they would definitely be seriously injured, if not dead. Um, and so here in the bottom right, you can see if somebody was cross country skiing um, and they got kind of close to the edge and a crack formed right here. And that a cornice almost slipped and fell. And if they did, they, they would have been seriously hurt probably or died as well. And then they were able to back up and move to the right. And so you wanna make sure you're staying away from edges because a lot of times they can be cornices and you can't tell. So you wanna make sure you give a wide berth when you're up in these regions like that and keep an eye out for them. Um, so avalanches. Um, I just want to say that um, this is not at all an avalanche course. There are um, different levels of avalanche courses out there. And if you're going to be going into the backcountry out of bounds, which means not at um, a ski resort um, up in the mountains, you should be taking um, avalanche courses. Um, this is just kind of hoping to give you some you know, context and maybe some information and resources for you to kind of know generally about this topic. So then you can go seek that information out. Um, so first I'm just gonna generally talk about conditions. The main thing that allows avalanches to occur is when you have slopes um, within a certain grade that have snow on them. And so this grade generally ranges from 30 to 45 um, degrees. That's when the most avalanches occur. Um, they also can occur from 25 to 30 um, but this is somewhat rare. And then from 45 to 60, they do sometimes occur, but they're generally much smaller. And because 
as you increase the grade of the slope, so you get more vertical, more vertical. Snow just kind of um, sloughs off constantly. You don't get these big slabs of snow that can all of a sudden fall. Um, and so um, I'm going to, in a minute, point out some resources so you can figure out if you're going to a place that has a certain um, grade or angle um, uh, for your trip. Um, and then there's also these um, clinometers um, that are attached to compasses that you can purchase. Um, that you can actually physically measure the slope that you're on. And so you can get a sense of like when you're actually out there of like, is this a condition that, you know, avalanches could occur. Um, and then on top of that, you also can start to think about um, what the snow conditions have been over the last several days and weeks and how that might affect it. Um, but that is something that we're not going to go into at all here. And if, again, if you want to learn more information about that type of thing, you're going to want to take an avalanche course. Um, so general safety equipment that you're going to need. You're going to want a shovel, a beacon, and a probe. Um, and those are completely essential. An airbag backpack is, um, you know, if you're going to be snowboarding or skiing in the backcountry, might, um, you know, a lot of people recommend that, but um, not quite an essential piece. Um, and so generally the beacon allows you to find somebody that's in your group um, and then the shovel to dig them out, obviously, and the probe additionally helps you find them. Um, yeah, so next here's some resources. So the North, if you're in the Pacific Northwest, the Northwest Avalanche Center is um, an amazing resource. It basically forecasts and gives you a sense of what the avalanche conditions are that day. Um, and here just below that, I have a diagram of kind of showing you the different um, courses that are available. Um, and these in the red are kind of recreational courses. And if you move further beyond this and you start to have, um, you know, professional aspirations to work in these environments, you will start to probably take courses like this. Um, so if we go to the Avalanche Forecast website, I just want to quickly show something. You'll, this is their kind of main page. Um, and you can see the Pacific Northwest map here. And you can select certain regions. And so we're in Portland. And so a lot of times we will be going to Mount Hood. And you can select that region. Um, and you can see that it has Mount Hood is completely yellow right now. And that tells you that it's a moderate condition. Um, and so it can kind of range from low, moderate, considerable, high, all the way up to extreme. Um, and you need to kind of make the decisions about whether you're going to be going. But you, again, shouldn't be going out into the back country um, unless you have kind of this avalanche experience or you're with people that do or in some sort of guided um, outing. Um, and something important to note is that the majority of deaths that occur on mountains due to avalanches occur um, when these conditions are considered either considerable than moderate. Um, high and extreme are fewer deaths and that's because less people are out in those conditions. Um, and so even though it's just moderate, people still um, can die in those conditions. You need to keep that in mind. Um, and then here below that are some other kind of other information. It kind of shows you the whole um, different regions of the mountain in terms of the cardinal directions. Um, and then also you can go here, and this is a great resource I'm just going to point out. So if you go to education and learn, uh, this gives you uh, resources for avalanche courses. So you can select this and it gives you all of the different courses that are occurring in the future. And a lot of these are starting to have, and most of them have um, virtual classrooms. And then you'll go outside and have a field day where you're actually in the snow and practicing some of those skills that you're gonna learn in the virtual classroom. I'm sure when COVID isn't a thing, it will be all in person or in the past it has been anyways. Um, yeah, so now back to the slide. Um, oop, back one more. Um, and then the final thing is, final resource to keep in mind is Caltopo. And this allows you to find the grade of the slope. Caltopo is a great resource though for planning any sort of hiking trip. Um, and so over here on the map, this is Mount Hood. Um, you can select different um, features to kind of be incorporated in the map. So right now I have the slope angle shading. And so this tells you that slope angle, which again, we know the condition for avalanches is somewhere between 30 and 45 degrees usually, can happen even at 25. And so that means areas that are ranging from yellow to dark red are avalanche, are conditions where avalanches can occur. 
Um, and so that means if you're planning a trip and you're like, oh, I'm going to go hiking over here, um, you know, you're like, okay, there isn't really any avalanche conditions there. That's a safe place for me to go. Um, but if you want to go somewhere else, you know, closer to the mountain, you might be like, oh, this whole ridge line or just below this ridge line is a lot of orange and red and that's um, avalanche conditions. And so I'm going to avoid that. And so just kind of, this is a nice tool to use. Um, okay, great. And so those are kind of general resources for avalanches. Um, and so now I think the next slide is back to Ian. Great, thanks, Carl. I'm gonna have to check out Mount Everest with that uh, avalanche filter on. So oh yeah, that'd be cool. All right, um, so the next thing getting into is skills, uh, camp setup. Um, so when you're out in the, on these winter adventures, a lot of the time you may want to uh, camp, set up a camp. Uh, so there are a couple of things that are associated with that. Specifically, there are uh, three components of a camp that we're talking about today. Those being the kitchen, the area where you'll be eating and preparing food, uh, your, your little duplex or your, your tent uh, where you'll be sleeping, and a restroom area. Um, yeah, those are the three things. Uh, distance, I just want to chat about that a little bit. Uh, when you're on most backpacking trips, uh, camping trips, you want to make sure that you're eating um, at least 200 feet away from where you're sleeping uh, and you're using the restroom at least 200 feet away from where you're sleeping and eating as well. Um, however, when you're in snowy conditions, that's not always uh, really feasible, uh, especially because visibility can become very low very quickly. You have to be careful about that, so keeping it closer is acceptable. Uh, just try to keep them, I guess, a reasonable distance away. Um, and we'll talk more about this triangle shape later, but essentially you want these three things to be in more or less a triangle shape. All right, next slide, thank you. All right, so for the tent setup, uh, there are a couple of steps to this, and we've got some pictures to help illustrate it. First of all, you're gonna wanna stomp down or flatten and compress um, an area large enough for your tent, plus a little bit extra. And then you're gonna wanna build your tent there. Uh, you can stake it down with sticks or tent stakes, or you can use specific snow stakes. If you're using tent stakes or sticks, you're gonna to wanna to make sure you use a dead man tent stake uh, technique. You can Google that. Uh, there's lots of information on it, but essentially you bury uh, the stake or stick sideways about six inches underneath the snow and then compress that snow on top of it. Uh, the idea behind that is that it won't be able to pull out as easily with uh, the total lack of friction that you know uh, snow is known for. So after that, uh, dig out your vestibule. Uh, sorry, same slide. Um, this is one that may not necessarily be super obvious um, for folks who aren't familiar with the terminology. The vestibule is the part of the tent uh, that the outside layer covers, but isn't part of the, the inside um, area where you're staying. So the picture on the top right here illustrates this fairly well. If you take a close look, the vestibule is this area outside of the um, sleeping compartment, and they have dug a hole underneath it that you can just see. Uh, it's probably about three, two to three feet deep. It's deep enough to toss all their gear in, keep it out of the elements as well as uh, take some of the some of the cold air in your in your tent will may fall down there. That's part of the theory at least. Um, and optionally, if you end up in a situation where you don't have a lot of shelter from the wind, you can build a snow wall uh, around this little domicile. So yeah, next slide please. Great. Uh, so the kitchen is something that can vary a lot depending on your needs. At the minimum, it's a definitive location uh, at which you eat and prepare your food. Therefore, your food scraps will all be in one place, easier to clean and uh, not leave a bunch of stuff around, essentially. However, people like to get creative with this option, especially if you're in a big group, it can be really fun. At the Outdoor Program, we love to make uh, creative kitchens. So what you can do here is something like what you see in this picture where you've got, you've essentially stomped down and carved out with your shovel a lot of these different areas, packed up this one in the middle probably to make it denser. Uh, and then you can cook on there, sit around here, get blocked, you know, block the wind. Uh, you can create your own elaborate shelves or anything like that for food. Uh, one really practical element of this is that you can cut a hole into your little ice block here, uh, keep the, the front part of it. And then uh, you'll be able to store your food in there overnight after you replace that front cover on there, uh, just like a little refrigerator. So. It's kind of a fun little thing, keep your food separate from your tent. You're just gonna to wanna to make sure that you uh, have them in mice-proof containers, uh, your food, because there can be mice out here. A lot of things live in this, what's called the subnivian zone underneath the snow. So watching out for that. All right, next slide, please. Okay, so for your restroom area, the most important things here are that you set a clear and definitive uh, specific area that you're using, you and your group. 
you have it uh, definitely closer than 200 feet. Um, just so that it's not too far away, people are getting lost out there. You want to define a clear path to the area. That is really important. Um, not something that you want to get lost over. And you need to pack out all solid waste, just making that more explicit again. That is how it is with winter adventures. All right, next slide, please. All right, so when you're selecting your site to have this whole camp set up, uh, you want something that offers a natural protection from the wind, especially at your sleeping site. Uh, that can be trees. Trees do a really, really good job. Or larger geological elements can work. You want to be out of range of avalanche danger. If there's a huge hill that's at exactly 35 degrees or something like that, uh, and you know that it's avalanche prone, then you're going to want to stay pretty far away from that. Uh, so even if an avalanche goes off overnight, you're out of the range of that. Um, something like a river valley or something between you and that can really help to provide some buffer there, I'm watching those geological features. Uh, and ideally, this one's not as important, but a visible landmark nearby to help you locate your location, uh, even if that's just a large tree or something, can be really good. Uh, leave no trace considerations. Snow is a durable surface, so camping on snow, trying not to harm vegetation, packing out your waste every time. Food crumbs, trying to keep those food crumbs away from the birds and mice that definitely are in these areas. Um, and the mice are there, I promise, uh, even if you don't see them. All right, next slide. Uh, and so the triangle, just coming back to that triangle that we started off with, the idea behind the triangle is that even in low visibility conditions, uh, you're going to be able to see all the different elements of your, uh, your camp setup. You're less likely to get lost. Um, if you, you know, are staying within this triangle zone, you'll, you'll have tracks going to various different places. Uh, so this is the, the recommended setup to have your, your, your camp in, the triangle formation. And that's all I've got about that. All right, uh, the last thing that I'm gonna chat, off, chat about before I hand it off to Carl um, to finish us, finish us here uh, is self-arrest and the ice axe. Uh, so self-arrest, I'll just read this definition that I wrote here. A mountaineering technique used to arrest a slide down a snow or ice slope uh, utilizes the ice axe tool. So this is a really important skill in mountaineering if you're doing uh, more advanced mountaineering things where you're going on steeper, more dangerous slopes where you could potentially slide out of control. However, uh, this is something that has to be taught and learned, well, at least learned and practiced in person with an ice axe on a snowy slope. Uh, so we can't really tell you how to do this here. You can find information online about it, but really, again, very much recommending that this is something that you learn uh, from an experienced instructor if it's something that you ever plan on putting yourself in a situation where you potentially need it. Um, it's a really great skill to have, and it's something that you can pick up. Probably, you know, your local REI or outdoor place will have some sort of uh, way to allow you to learn this. So that's all I'm going to say about that. I've got a picture of an ice axe and someone doing a self-arrest down there, but I'm going to hand it off at this point, actually. Great. Thanks, Ian. Um, so to finish this off, I'm going to talk about several different activities or um, things that you might be doing out in the outdoors. Um, starting with cross-country skiing, and then I'll be talking about um, snowshoeing, and then finally the use of crampons. Um, and so when talking about cross-country skiing, I'm going to first kind of generally talk about Nordic versus cross-country skiing or kind of the different types of skiing um, and how they relate to each other. Um, I'm talking about the equipment um, needed, um, a very brief introduction to the techniques, just so you kind of know the names and then you maybe can look them up and, and um, maybe somebody else ask some, somebody else to show you how to do them. Um, and then also some places that you can go cross country skiing near Portland. Um, and generally, you know, in the past, um, the outdoor program has led trips cross country skiing, but because of COVID, we are not this winter, but next winter we will be doing this again. And so you can always come with us next winter. Um, so skiing. So Nordic skiing is kind of um, a general catch-all term for non-downhill skiing. Um, uh, but then you, within that, you have cross-country skiing, telemark skiing, and alpine touring skiing. Um, and so within cross-country skiing, there are three other types. There's the classic track, there's the skate skiing, and touring skiing. So I'm going to generally be talking about the classic track skiing, but a lot of these have similar um, concepts and terminologies around them. Um, and then here in the bottom right uh, corner, um, we have just quick kind of image of the different types of skis or what they generally would look like. So the classic ski kind of has a middle width between the um, touring ski and the skate ski, um, and is pretty parallel ski most of the time in a wide um, tip 
rounded tip. Um, and then the touring ski is a little bit wider and wides out even more at the tip generally. And the skate ski is pretty much the most narrow and kind of much more pointed. Um, and so again, generally going to be talking about the classic ski, track ski um, for the rest of the section. Um, so I'm going to point out uh, some specific information about the skis, boots, and poles. So here, um, the important thing to know about these skis is that there is this kick zone in the middle where this camber occurs. And so the camber is just basically where the ski arches and there's a grip section, which has like these little teeth basically that allow you to um, grab and get some traction. And so you need to push down with your feet to engage that, um, that kick zone. Um, and so that's an important thing to kind of know um, its utility and function. Um, and so then for skis, um, a lot of it, cross-country skis are based on weight um, because you need to be able to push that camber down. But also generally the height um, is going to be somewhere around the, um, you know, from the floor up to um, your wrist if your hand is above your head. Um, that's a good kind of rule of thumb. Um, and so then for boots, there's um, lots of different variations on the boot um, that you might be using, but they all have um, a connection near the ball of your foot at the toe of your foot and not at the heel. Whereas downhill skiing has both the toe and the heel secured um, to the binding only the toe of your foot uh, for cross-country skiing. And so here's several different types and variations of both the boot and the bindings. Um, and you can look further into those different types if you're interested. Um, and so then the poles. And so the poles are very important um, in cross-country skiing. Um, they have several different features, um, all very important. Um, and generally with the pole um, for fitting, you want it to be about your um, armpit. It should be able to come up to your armpit from the ground. Um, and so I'm gonna briefly again, just talk about terminology around these techniques. Um, and then you can you know, look them up um, further or maybe somebody else that you know or instructor can show you how to do these things. Um, and so there's, um, the proper resting position. And so that means if you're moving along um, and you're kind of gliding down the hill or you just have momentum and you're just moving, um, you might be sitting basically. And you wanna have your knees um, bent a little bit and your shoulders relaxed and um, kind of your hips bent as well and leaning forward slightly. Um, and that allows you to react. Um, the diagonal stride is kind of the main um, mode to be able to move forward or propel yourself forward. There's also the double pulling that allows you to do that. Um, two different types of techniques for kind of propelling yourself forward. Um, and then another important general technique is how do you actually get up when you fall down? And these are things that you should kind of learn beforehand and you know kind of practice um, before you really get out into um, onto the tracks um, too far. Um, and then um, for uphill, you can have a, there's a slight variation on the diagonal stride, the uphill diagonal stride. And there was also the herringbone. And so the herringbone is shown here on the right. Basically you have the toes spread very far apart. And then the, the back ends, the, the tails of your skis are near each other. And that allows you to get more friction um, and move up a hill, especially if it's slippery. Um, and then downhill you need to know is the snowplow shown here in this um, 3D rendering. Um, and this is very similar to downhill. Actually in this picture it is in downhill boots and bindings. Um, and then there's the kick turn, also used in cross-country skiing, um, very, but not that often. And so that one is not necessary to know, but you definitely are going to want to learn the snowplow early on. Um, and so there's now some places to go. Um, so all of these places listed here, Teacup Lake, Trillium Lake, and Mount Meadows have groomed tracks. Um, and they have um, both cross-country, the classic cross-country um, skiing, and also skate skiing. Um, on those tracks. And so Teacup is over here near Mount Meadows on the south um, east side of the mountain. So this is Mount Hood, if you did not notice already. Um, and I can scroll down, show you where Trillium Lake is down here, just mainly south of the mountain. And then Mount Meadows is back over here. Um, okay, so now snowshoes. Um, 
So I'm generally just going to point out some of the, the, the equipment and some of the features of the equipment and then places again to go. Um, so there's a lot of different you know features that you might want to point out or I can point out here, but the main things are um, you have kind of this deck area um, and also similar to the deck area is this tail and that allows you to um, spread out your weight along across the surface of the snow, which again allows you not to post hole and allows you to stay up on top of the surface and float basically on the surface. Um, and then you have the bindings, which bindings just like for snowboarding and skiing and things is allowed allows you to get your boot in there and attach your boot to this. And so it's securely uh, attached to your snowshoe. Um, and then there's also the crampon. So at the front end of um, right here as well of the snowshoe are these crampons that basically dig into um, the snow or ice or whatever you're on and allows you to have a little bit more security and traction. Um, and so there's a lot of um, snowshoes also have traction rails that run parallel to your foot. Um, and these ones are right here. And those again are allow you to get traction. And then there's one here and here as well. Um, and that might look different for different um, snowshoes. Another thing that some snowshoes have, not most, is a heel lift. And that really allows you to kind of go up big ascents. Um, it makes it a lot easier on your legs to do that with the heel lift. Uh, most won't have this. Um, all right, next is just a couple, pointing out a couple places. Again, Trillium Lake is great for uh, snowshoeing. Um, then White River. Um, right here, kind of in between government camp and um, teacup. Um, and then Mirror Lake is just um, prior to government camp if you're coming from Portland. Um, and those are all kind of great places to go um, snowshoeing. So now finally crampons. And so crampons are um, mainly used in, you know, situations that are, you know, slightly more um, risky. Um, so you're either going to be on a steep slope or in very icy conditions or a combination of the two. Um, and you're usually a lot of times you're either on a glacier or you're probably going to be trying to summit the mountain. Um, and so I'm going to go over again the equipment, when to use it, and then the technique. So here's a couple different versions of a crampon. And the most basic um, highlighted here at the top right, um, again, has here we have the anatomy of it and all the different kind of features. Um, and so you have your um, front points, the very two are just called the front points and then the next two near the front are called your secondary points and the rest are referred to as your flat points. Um, and so if you're gonna be kicking in to the snow, um, these will really dig in um, and allow you to get some traction. And um, the two front, if you're kicking in with your toe, both the front and the secondary will really be the ones that are grabbing and doing the work. And if you're flat footed, the ones that are going to mainly be doing work are the flat ones and then also sometimes the secondary. Um, and so with these, you also have again bindings. You have the toe bindings and the heel bindings. And then the strap and the buckle allows you to pull those together and tighten around your boot um, and make it secure so then you can wear it and walk and not have to worry about it coming off. Um, and so that's a general kind of um, features of most of the crampons. Um, and so when are we going to be using them? And so again, as I kind of previously mentioned, um, when the snow becomes more firm, hard, ice-like. Um, and so here in the top right, you can see this is very like nice powder, um, soft, fluffy snow. You won't really need to probably need it for this. Um, but as it becomes harder and you have somewhat of an incline, you're going to want to probably pull these out. Um, and then as uh, the slope angle increases, you also will want to more and more consider putting these on. And so you can see in this picture, it's kind of flat here, and then it starts to go up and up and up, increasing the, the grade of the slope. Um, and then finally, if you're ever on a glacier, you're going to have crampons on, um, even if it's flat, just because it's so icy and you have crosses and other features where you can slip and get hurt um, and fall down into. Um, and so here are just some techniques. I'm not going to go into detail with these, but I'm just going to point them out. Um, so the first one is flat foot, also known as the French technique. Um, and again, it's going to use those flat points. Um, and it'll allow you to get the most points of contact, which is good. And it also um, is the most easy on your calves and your legs. Um, 
So a little bit, you know, more endurance oriented. Um, and then the front pointing, um, and again, it's kind of in the name of it, you're going to be using those front points and then the secondary points mainly, um, kicking in with your toes. And But this is much harder on your um, calves and your legs, but you also can go quicker this way. Um, so they have trade-offs. And then a hybrid is some combination of the two. Um, there's no like, it's this specific combination, it's any sort of combination of the two. Um, and this is the American technique. Um, and then so that is our kind of general presentation about winter adventures. We tried to do a grab bag of everything um, and we hope you learned something. We hope this um, somewhat inspired you to get out, do something in, in, during the winter. It can help with seasonal depression. Um, I know sometimes you get stuck inside for long times and that can be a bummer. And so hopefully you can get out this winter and enjoy, enjoy the snow. Do you have anything to add, Ian? Great, yeah, thanks a lot, Carl. I would just add that if you do need extra motivation to get up there, I do highly recommend it. Sometimes in the city, it feels like winter is just kind of a gray thing, especially in Portland. But once you get up on there on the mountain, a lot of the time it's like blue skies and you're totally comfortable and it's super awesome. Um, so I highly recommend getting into winter adventures if it's not something you've tried before and you happen to be watching this video, I would encourage you to do that personally. But that's all and, I'm And you can always rent gear from us at the outdoor program at Portland State University. So stop by, get some info, get some gear, and we'll get you set up. Great. All right. All right. No questions tonight? Say good night. Doesn't seem like it. <laughs> Oh, well, yeah. So, I mean, this video is going to get posted. And so if you have questions, leave them in the comments. There you go.